So today is Daniel 2, and so let's uh, go there, Daniel 2, and we're stepping through one of the most incredible books that has ever been. Uh, like I said, you can bring your scepticism to this and it will not survive. I tell you what will survive, you don't underestimate the ability of man to ignore the facts so that he continue in his wickedness. Okay, so facts don't convince people, the Spirit of God convinces people. Okay, but it's, it says, come let us reason together. So we're going to go through some things uh, today. So uh, let's go through uh, Daniel chapter 2. We'll read that first, then we'll come back and go through a little bit. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, uh, so, uh, I should say, and Nebuchadnezzar had, the, had dreams. His spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans, uh, to tell the king. Chaldean is, is also not only a people, but a, an office there as well. So you see he's mentioning four officers. Of all those officers, there are links to the occult. In most of them, it was an occult. That was their culture. Okay, It was immersed in occultism. And so uh, no, no, re- no, uh, no mystery why at the back end of the book we have mystery Babylon recurring, Okay, where we'll have a uh, rise in occultism or our belief in uh, uh, metaphysics that uh, that is not Christian. So here we go. And the king, I have a, had a dream. Okay, so they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, "I have," a, and I should say it changes that the the goes from Hebrew to Chaldean here or Aramaic. So we now start our our journey through this book. Remember, we said the first chapter relates to Jews primarily. Then we move into all Gentile history, and so we're going to go through that um, as we as we step through this. So the language changes to tell us who he's addressing. And he says, I have had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. Here we go. O king, live forever. That's always a good line to lead with. Okay, that's called brown nosing where I came from. Okay, um, he said, the king, live forever. Um, and uh, it says, tell your servants the dream and we will give you the interpretation. Here we go. This is how it goes. Uh, you, you give us a lead in and I'll tell you what we'll pull off our shells uh, Freud and Young and we can tell you what the dream means you know all you got to tell us the dream we'll give you an interpretation okay um, I should say in this regard um, don't discount that God can give unsaved people a word a dream a vision a prophetic word you say when did that happen Caiaphas, unsaved man, wicked, right? Doing the bidding of Satan, and yet he says it's, it's sufficient for one man to die for the nation. The difference is they don't have a clue what they're saying. They get a dream, but they don't know the interpretation. They can't, they can't discern it properly, but they can get these dreams that will trouble them, that will, will spark things, or visions, or whatever, but they can get them, but they won't understand them. So Caiaphas prophesies... But he has no idea what he's saying. He thinks he's talking about this situation, but he's actually talking about an eternal situation. You say, can you give us a further example? Yes, I can. Judas, a man inhabited by Satan. And at the end of it, when he goes to hang himself, he says these words. Jesus' blood was innocent blood. He spoke to the sinless nature of Christ out of the mouth of a man inhabited by Satan. But they don't know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? Themselves, they they get this thing, but they have no understanding of what the ramifications are. The difference is that those who are walking in the Spirit of God, He gives understanding. We become wise as we listen to the Spirit of God, okay? So don't be disturbed that Nebuchadnezzar, an unsaved king, a man who roasts his officers on the fire, (laughs) makes houses dung heaps, kills families, this man gets a vision, okay? Uh, however, he doesn't know what it means. And he says, okay, the king answered and said to the Chaldees, my decision is firm. If you don't make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. There we go. That would get you deep into the books, wouldn't it? However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. Understand what Nebuchadnezzar is coming out of. He's coming out of his dad. These are his dad's advisors. 
So these are the old guard, if you like. He's the new king. He doesn't know these people from Adam. Nebuchadnezzar was in Babylon ruling. Nebuchadnezzar was out conquering. He was a, he was a fantastic general. And so he doesn't know these guys from Adam. He comes back and he's got, now got to take over the kingdom and he's trying to test, you know, is this, is this tarot reading? Is this astrology? Is this for real or is it rubbish? You know what I mean? Let's have a look, see if you can really cut the mustard. If you're going to be my advisor, I want to know if this thing's real. If you're telling me you've got spiritual power here or there, let me know if it's real or not. And so this is the test he's putting up. And the king answered and said, I know that for certain you would gain time. Okay, plan for time here. Because you see that my decision is firm. If you don't, he re re reiterates his program. If you don't make known to me the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. He's absolutely right. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. Here's another thing to note, okay? Listen, there's... Just so we can cover off some things while we go through. I wasn't planning to stay in these, but I will. Um, what we, With these things here, only God can look at the, the mind and the intents of the heart. We're not to judge the intents of the heart. We judge the fruit. We don't go to motives. Oh, they did that because they did this. Blah, blah. No, no, we don't know what the motives are. But it says that there will come a time when God will reveal the intents and thoughts of the heart. God has that power. Not Satan. Only God knows the intents of your heart. The thoughts that go through your head. Only he knows these things. Unless God opens the door so that the devil can, can know. But otherwise, it's the dominion of God to know these things. The secret things belong to God. Okay? However, you'll find you go, if, I don't know if any of you have this background, but if you go to uh, people who, who perform dark arts, they may seem to know thoughts. But what's happening there is the demonic, they, the devil puts thoughts in your head. He gives you a nightmare, gives you, a train, gives you something that's going on. Then you go and see one of these jokers and he tells you what you saw. It's not, he doesn't know what your thoughts is. He's putting a thought in there to try and show you, to trick you. This is not his domain. How do you know? Because it says... If the devil had known what Jesus was up to, he wouldn't have crucified him. So he had no idea, even though, and I read it yesterday, in the Gospels, I'm surprised how many times Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, and after three days I'm going to come out of the grave. And I don't know what they were thinking they was, he was saying, but they had no idea what was going on. And either did the devil, by the way. Right? So the domain of thoughts... This is the domain of God. So what this unsaved guy has said as well is absolutely true. There's no man on earth who can do what you're saying. And if it does happen through some sort of dark power, it's because the, the thing that's been put in your head is from a demonic source. It's not of God, okay? So don't be fooled by these sort of things. Okay, let's keep moving. I didn't want to go down those things. But anyway, uh, there's not a man on earth... And that's very rare, by the way. You go, you try this. Go, go to someone who's, who thinks they've got some sort of power in the other realm. You say this, I'm thinking of a number, tell me what it is. And they'll say, well, you tell me the number and I'll tell you what it means. Because you're born under a number here and I can tell you what, if you tell me the number. No, they got no idea. Okay, it's a difficult thing that the king requests and there is no other who could tell it to the kings except God, uh, the gods. His dwelling is not with flesh. And that's not our God, by the way. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave command to destroy all the wise men at Babylon. So the decree went out. And they began killing the wise men. They start killing the wise men. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which had gone out to kill all the wise men in Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king and gave him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. 
Then Daniel went to his house and made a decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek the mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions may not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Here's another thing, just so we're, while we're on these things. Listen, all these guys who boast, oh, I got the miracles in my hands, I'll just do whatever I like and I can do it whenever I like and whatever. Well, Daniel had the gift of interpretation of dreams. It tells you that in chapter 1. Why, when, he, when the Nebuchadnezzar gives the decree, okay, tell me what the decision, and they can't do it, why didn't Daniel say, man, I'm the gun-ho brother here, I can do that. God's given me that gift. Because he has to wait until they're killing the wise men. He's under pressure. He doesn't offer, you can't... You don't have that power. God's spirit comes upon you. The presence of the Lord is present to heal. Right? We're not, I can dispense whatever I like, whenever I like. No, you can't. You're a channel from which God flows and if God doesn't do it, you've got empty words. I can push every one of you over at the front here. That doesn't mean the spirit of God's on it at all. That means I can manipulate you and walk backwards. I had a bloke do it to me brother-in-law. He hasn't been a Christian since because he thinks we're all frauds. But I can tell you that the Spirit of the Lord can come on people and bang, the whole place will be down. He did it in the temple, is that right? Smoke filled the temple and they all fell on their faces. So just to say that, listen, people who boast that they've got miracles on tap, do what Pilate said. In Jesus Christ Superstar. Walk across my swimming pool. Do that for me and I'll let you go free was the song. Is that right? They can't. They can make a good show. They can tell you. They can make it all happen. Uh, it look like it happens even. But the proof is in the pudding. A genuine miracle can be tested, can be seen, easy. Go and get a medical document. They had this before and they had this afterwards. It's a miracle from God. It cannot be denied. Okay, so these guys, he's pushed to this point where they're on his doorstep, they're going to kill him. At that point, he's in a point of desperation. He says, God, give me, give me the understanding of this thing and I'll, I'll reveal it. Stop killing the wise man. Give me time. Okay, he's not boastful in his gifting. He's, when he's pushed into a place where he's going to die, he says, God, help me exercise in this way. Okay, so he's not flaunting, he's not boastful, he's not prideful. This is a case of necessity here and they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Okay, plus the fact, what did he do? He said, did he say, oh, that's my gifting. I'll just go to the court and tell him now. No, they go into prayer and fasting to have God reveal it to them. It's not a thing, oh, this is, God, this is right up my alley. God gave me this gifting, oh, I'm all over this. Bring me before the king. No, they go to prayer and fasting and he gets his mates involved as well. They need a miracle, okay? They need something supernatural here. And so uh, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes, this is the same, the Antichrist will do the same, try and do the same thing, we won't go there. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to, to me what uh, we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed and, uh, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell, you, uh, tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man of the captives. I have found a man. Didn't, <laughs> Daniel revealed himself to him. This is, this is how big organizations work. Oh, oh, I found this man. <laughs> no, Ariok couldn't have a clue. But uh, it says, Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. 
The king answered and said to Daniel, Whose name was Belshazzar? Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. He's underlining the fact that they are inept in this area. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to, my, to your mind while you're on your bed about what would come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom or, or, than anyone living, but for our sakes who made known the interpretation of the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image, the, the image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold and its chest of arms and its silver and its bellies and thighs of bronze and its legs of iron, uh, it's partly of iron and partly of clay. Two verses. Man, when we unpack this, I want to tell you the density of God's word. Two verses. Uh, you watch while a stone was cut without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and it became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried away so that no trace of them was found. The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. For the, Lord, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Imagine telling this king, an arrogant man, and you tell him, you're sitting on that throne because of my God. Okay? Uh, kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whoever the children, uh, wherever the children of men dwell, all the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them, even the beasts. Okay? That's significant for other reasons. But anyway, you are the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. As for to the, the toes and the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so that the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Hallelujah. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke the pieces of iron, the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, I bet he did, prostrated before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering, an incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made the ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Not the whole uh, kingdom, but the province of Babylon, okay? And the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon, two men that God says nothing bad of, Joseph and Daniel, both of them, funnily enough, were prime ministers. Hey, eh? How's that? Uh, if only we had them today. Okay, also Daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Daniel, but Daniel sat at the gate of the king. Okay, so let's start making our way through these things. He's sorting out the wheat from the chaff here just to say that he's showing them this vision. It's a weird vision. You imagine getting that vision. 
seeing this great big statue, all these different things that are, that are on there. What does this mean? A big stone comes and smashes the lot to pieces. It's a weird dream. You wouldn't know what it meant either. Daniel comes and, and reveals that there's kingdoms that's going on there, but he says before that this will reveal what's going to happen in the latter days. So it's not just the ge uh, generic um, Gentile history, but it's history that will go all the way to the end, to the latter days. When I say the end, when we say latter days, Peter said we're in the, it's evident that we're in the last days because the spirit of Antichrist in the world, there are many Antichrists, okay? But then it gets suspended. We get the age of the church, the, the seventh, 70th week of Daniel ceases. We have a gap between 69 and 70. In there is this mystery called the church. Okay? So the last days get suspended. Think of it like this. Okay? We're at the state of origin, game three. There's this melee that breaks out, and Gagai's got this guy by the throat. <laughs> at that point, We've got five minutes to half time. But these two are going at it. Well, mainly one. <laughs> and so the ref goes, Beep! what happens? Time stops. So for the latter days, the time has stopped. We are now in an age of grace, right? That is going on. Then, but at the, the time is coming where God will say, okay, Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles have come in clock's back on again. We go into the 70th week of Daniel, right? So that's what's going on at the moment. So this indeterminate period of time that we have as, as the church age. But the latter days, what we're talking about, are we, I say last days, but that's wrong. Okay? Latter days, what are we talking about? We're really talking about the close of the end of this age. Because we've got another thousand years after this for the millennium, is that right? So when I say last days, we really mean last days of this age, the end of the age, okay? So that's what we mean when we say the last days. I could give you the scriptures here, but Jeremiah 48, 47, 49, 39, Jeremiah 23, 20, Jeremiah 30, 24. You can look at it on the tape. Those all tell you that the latter days refer to the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that when they use that terminology, we get, we get that going on there. Also, let's be careful because you'll see many commentators, even people I highly respect, Chuck Missler is one of them. He will tell you those graphs that we went through before we started, that at the end, uh, when we go to the first siege, 70 years on, the end of the Babylonian captivity, that tells, that he says, that starts the time of the Gentiles. Right? We've got two different things. We've got the, the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled and we've got um, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, not times of the Gentiles. What's the other one? The fullness of the Gentiles. Okay, the two different terms. People, they're not the same. They're not the same. But be careful. If you go in your Bibles, I think, I could be wrong here, but let's have a look at Revelation 11. Let's have a look. And it gives us a definition of what uh, times of the Gentiles is. Can you make your way through that and try and find times of the Gentiles? Uh, fish the testimony, dead bodies. Like I said, I should have actually got these down. Maybe it's not Revelation 11. Could be wrong. Uh, I haven't got anything on here, I don't think. Anyway, don't trust me, but have a look at it. <laughs> In the book of Revelation, it defines the times of the Gentiles as 42 months. Now, it may be that the times of the Gentiles is enacted in other ways, okay? But all we can be sure of is that the time of the Gentiles is 42 months, three and a half years. So we can't be throwing around definitions that we're not for, but we can say the fullness of the Gentiles is absolutely right. Romans 11 tells you that they will, will go there until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. There's a time allotted for us who are non-Jews to get in through this thing called the church. There's a counter. The angels are counting everybody that gets saved. At some point, there's going to be a fullness of that number and that'll be it. And God will turn his salvific purposes, his purposes of salvation, away from the Gentiles and back to his, his covenant people. Okay? And it'll be, it's not going to be one day. 
It'll be like the book of Acts. We start with the Jews and gradually as you work through the book of Acts, we end up with the Gentiles at the end. So there'll be a tapering off the same way. Much what we're seeing today, Gentile churches going into apostasy and a lot of people getting saved in Israel. More people saved in Israel in the last 50 years than in the last 2,000 years. And so God is starting to turn these things. So we don't know when this is. No one could say it's Tuesday the 15th. No one knows, but there is a time where the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. As we get towards the end, absolutely we're going to cross that line over there. Okay, so that's, that's those two terms taken care of, or at least given you some sort of things to look at. So have a look. Let's go quickly in our Bibles. Um, Job 10. Let's have a look at that. Job chapter 10, just to, to get some things under thing. Uh, <coughs> Maybe we, let's just start, go to Job 10, that's fine, let's go to Job 10. Uh, let's start there. Job 10. Uh, let's go through this, this is the vision first, okay? So what we see is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Here it is here, well, who knows what it looked like, but anyway, this is some artist's impression. We start off with a head of gold, which is Babylon, thank God, I mean, he's, he's the most important, you know what I mean? Uh, imagine if he was the Tupperware at the bottom. Uh, but anyway, we had Babylon here. Oh, king, great king, how wonderful you are. Okay, then we go, this is Babylon. Then we go to the next one, which is Breast of Silver. It becomes, remember, we get the end of the captivity of Babylon at the end of 70 years. Cyrus the Mede, uh, uh, Cyrus the Persian and Darius the Mede come in, conquer Babylon, and then it begins the Persian Empire, or the Medo-Persian Empire, we call it, okay? Um, then, uh, we should say, uh, as we go along here, to just... Like I say, the density that's in two verses. We've got a head of gold. You know now, even today, they cannot work out how they irrigated uh, one of the seventh wonders of the world, the Hanging ba Gardens of Babylon. They had no idea how they irrigated that. It was majestic. We got no idea how majestic Babylon was. The city of Babylon was, had such thick, thick walls, they held chariot races, according to the historians, four abreast along the walls. This was no... This is a huge city, man. You know what I mean? This is like New York or London or Paris, or one of these major centers uh, in the ancient world. So we don't know what was in here of gold, but Persia is a little bit less, okay? But it's in that section of the body, there is two... Arms. Good, good, good guess. You're the only one with boldness to speak, brother. There we go. Two arms. The density in God's word. This is not one empire, this is Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. Two arms gathered together to make a torso that creates a kingdom. Okay, so we've got this going on. Then we've got a third one, thighs of brass, which is Greece. It's no coincidence that it's the groin area, the abdominal area. It's the seminal influence for everybody in Europe and the Middle East area. All of the fact that we are democratic nations is based on democracy which comes from Greece. They had councils and parliaments where they would uh, flesh out the matters of governance with the Athenians. And so that comes from there. What about all our hospital systems? They take an oath, don't they, before that? Well, God knows what happened to that oath, but anyway. <laughs> Hippocrates. He's not a hypocrite, it's a Hippocratic oath. Thou shalt do no harm. That comes from Greece. Do you know that trial by jury comes from Greece? What about science? What about mathematics? Archimedes in the bath, displacement. Okay, we use it today for submarines and ships, all this sort of stuff, based on the maths of Archimedes, a Greek. What about Pythagoras' theorem? Oh, our brains are hurting now, we're going back. But a lot of this mathematics is based on Greeks. It's a seminal influence that goes through even till today. It comes from this groin area, it comes from that abdominal area, and has an influence that goes all through the whole body, okay? Like I say, the density of the scripture. Then we have the legs of Rome, okay? We've got Re Rome. Now, Rome was one empire. 
but we get slightly past the time of Christ and we see a fragmentation which tells you that this is not just kingdoms that go up to the time of Christ. We're actually going past the time of Christ because we come with the eastern and western leg of the Roman Empire. Two legs. Two legs. Then we come down to the last one where we've got feet of iron, feet of clay, and we'll come back to that. All another thing so I want to just have a look at. Notice how the how we go from precious metals and less value, less value, less value, less value is what's going on. God arranges it like this from, from a glory point of view. It goes downwards. However, in a strength point of view, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger until the last, until the last. And you know, Rome delighted itself delighted itself. If we go back to the, to the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, he, was, he wanted all the influences. He, he wanted the whole world to be interconnected and all this. Is, so we wanted uh, Greece, uh, Greek as the, as the language of everybody there. So like your abdo abdominals, everything from the body flowing through those areas. A and so he wanted that. Rome delighted itself in the destruction of civilizations. They would take your God and put it in the pantheon, but they were into smashing and destroying things, right? They would camp out of cities for 25 years and starve them out just so they could decimate them. That was the determination of Rome. However, we've got two legs going on here. The other thing I want you to notice about this statue, I haven't heard any other commentator say this thing, so don't take it as gospel. This could be rubbish. But all, one thing I noticed, when we look at the time frames of these things, we said 606 BC, well, we, we start that, that first siege. So Babylon starts the year before, 605 to 539. Then we go 539 to 331. Okay? We notice that, that that date there, 539 to 331, is much more than this date. Is that right? The, the amount of years of the kingdom. All I want you to notice, then we go to Greece, 331 to 168. We end up with uh, a longer time frame again. But Rome, 168 to 476. Would you say on the human body that the legs are almost half the dimensions of your human body? Well, I would. I'm a bit of a giraffe, you know. Uh, but the proportion of the human body, not only, not only is God showing you in a picture, he's showing you the lengths of these kingdoms. Right? We've got a short kingdom. Oh, I wrote down the years. I think uh, 133 years, the top one. Then we go, so the, measure your head on your torso, and it goes twice, okay? Then we go 133, 207 for the Medo-Persian area. Then we go uh, to the next one. It's 171 years, which is, that's longer. This is shorter, is that right? So 171 years. Then we come to the last one. It's over 500 years. It's long. So God puts in a little picture... Not only how many legs of the empire, but lengths of empires. You see the density in God's... We will know when he says, don't remove a yacht or a tittle. He's not kidding. Because there's so much density in what God says, we, we struggle to unravel the thing. Here he is giving us all this in this picture. Now, when we look at it, we're tempted, and you see this diagram, you're tempted to say there are five kingdoms here. Okay, this is how we tend to think of it. But there's only four because you read in Daniel 7 and he gives the same picture. This is how man sees his kingdoms. Man looks at this and there's image, they, every, every man loves an image. Is that right? You go to museums and here's statues of himself, a little bust. <laughs> You know what I mean? They lo men love images. God showing us how man sees the kingdoms. But in Daniel 7, he shows you how God sees the kingdoms. And he shows them as beasts. Terrible beasts, okay? Where we go through, um, you know, the winged lion at the start there. Then we go, the bear is the next one. And don't start allying the bear is Russia. Let's deal with what the scripture tells us. Deal with that, you know what I mean? Don't overlay your own meanings. Let's deal with what actually happened. Then we've got a leopard that goes in there. The animals are coming down also in glory till we get to the last one, and it's just called a terrible beast. 
and there is a beast coming that will be absolutely terrible. But the Roman Empire was uh, incredibly uh, hard as well. All right, so one thing we would say here as well, because many people would go and take this and say, okay, we stop at the time of Christ. That's the Roman Empire. Once that's done, the prophecy is over. I have a problem with that because the stone that comes and destroys, Jesus didn't come and destroy the Roman Empire. He wasn't interested, is that right? They said, let's, win, let's make you king and let's overthrow these fellas. And Jesus said, I'm not interested in that. Judgment starts at the house of God. You fellas got to be dealt with. They wanted a saviour who would take the, the, yoke, the Roman yoke off them. Jesus wasn't interested. He said, I'm not coming at that time. When he comes back, though, the government will be upon his shoulders, as Scripture says. Is that right? And every kingdom that we're talking about here will be destroyed in that. Do you know what? We, we, we're all champions in the West and we're in love with ourselves. Democracy is the way. Let's all have a vote. All the people want it. God's not into democracy. It's a system that works now in this age. But the time is coming, coming when the government will be upon his shoulders and he's not a democracy. He's a monarchy. Okay? And he's not a communist. So all the men's, all the systems that we run things with now will go. His kingdom will destroy every other kingdom before that. Okay? So we're going to see something that uh, will be magnificent for us and a hard thing to swallow for maybe some of the other things. Um, I can't even read my own writing there, so I don't know what that's about. Uh, all right. The only thing I would say about the last bit, let's go through some scriptures. Do Job chapter 10. How am I going for time? Can, can someone give me half an hour? I will finish in half an hour wherever we're at. Is that okay? Or well, half an hour too long? Let's go 25. How's 25 sound? 25's good? Can, so can someone lock it in? All right, let's go that. Okay, let's go quick then. Okay, so let's go Job 10 verse 9. It says, Remember I pray that you have made me like clay and, I, and you turn me into dust again. Okay, your hands made me, you fashioned me. Remember I, you made me like clay. Okay, that's Job 10 9. Let's go to Isaiah 29 6. Just to show you a couple of things here. Isaiah 29 16. Isaiah 29 16. Let's go. You guys all got phones. I can't hear the pages. 29.16, okay, I'll probably find scripture quicker with it, okay. Surely uh, you have t things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as, clay, as the clay? For so shall the thing uh, made say of him who made it, he did not make me, or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding, that's clay. It's Isaiah 64, while we're in the book of Isaiah 64, and verse 8, let's just take these scriptures, get them out of the way, and then we'll go from there. 64, 8, but now, O Lord, you are Father, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. And all we are work of your hand, etc. Okay, all we, plural, plural, plural. Let's go to Romans 9.21. Let's have a look. Uh, just so we get a reference from the New Testament. Uh, let's go back here. Come on, baby. Let's go. Romans, and we said 9. So this is the historical element uh, for... Yeah, and it says, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honour and another vessel for dishonour? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endureth with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessels of mercy which he had prepared for beforehand for our glory, even us whom he called not out of the Jews only, but also out of the Gentiles? You'll notice when they talk in this, there's a passage in Jeremiah too. We sing the song, I am the potter, I, yeah, I am the clay, you're the potter, whatever it is. I can't even remember the words on that. But anyway, something like that. Now you are the potter, I'm the clay. But we personalize it. When he speaks of clay, clay is always about peoples, plural, people groups. Okay, when he speaks in Jeremiah or even in Romans 11, we've made some for honor, some for dishonor. What's he talking about? He made the Jews for this, t he's making a vessel of dishonor. For the last 2,000 years, they've been a vessel of dishonor. Okay? But we have been honored. Is that right? 
We have been a vessel, a cistern. We haven't made our own cistern. Jeremiah 2.13, we didn't make our own cistern. He gave us a cistern and filled it, okay? They made their own. They're a vessel for dishonor. But it's a people group. God is not sending individuals to hell. But I want to tell you this very clearly. He does mark out the nations and their paths. Okay? There'll be nations that'll have a spirit over them. God will drive them that direction to fulfill the things of history. But each individual has a choice in there. He does not condemning anybody to hell. You have a choice, but the nations, the nations he deals with and he turns the king's hearts as he will. Okay? You think when you had a bad king in Israel that all the people were bad? No. Some went and did the worship of whatever they did, but no, the king was bad and it turned the whole nation. So he turns the nations, but individuals... Don't tell me you don't have freedom to choose Jesus Christ. You absolutely do. You do. And we see it in every, every nation. Is that right? Because in Revelation, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, there'll be people in heaven speaking these things. All right, so um, oh, where are we here? No idea. All right. So we've got those. That's the, that's the, uh, the, the clay side of things. Now, let's. I haven't got these organized, but let's just... Um, it says about this stone that comes, it's a stone that's not cut, it's not hewn, it's not cut with human hands, okay? It's a, just a, a stone that comes and smashes this thing. All right, so um, let's go, we're in Isaiah, so let's turn to Isaiah 9.10 to start with. Isaiah 9.10. It's funny how the book, you know, is recurring themes over and over God saying the same thing in a different way to us so Isaiah 9 10 says this the bricks have fallen down but we will rebuild with hewn stones the sycamores are cut down but we will replace them with cedars and it's talking about altars here the what he juxtaposes let me just grab this is two things and it's a recurring theme. We have unhewn stones. Now on that, well, let's go to, uh, let me think, Genesis, Genesis 11, let's have a look. Uh, and Genesis 11, and let's go verse 3, start of the chapter anyway, let's have a look. Okay, here we go. Talking about Babel, okay? Going back to the Tower of Babel here. And it says, It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found in the plain of the land of Shinar, Babylon. They dwelt there and they said to one another, Come, let us make... What do you got? Bricks. That's it, bricks, okay? Uh, for stone. And they had asphalt for mourning. So God compares two things. He says, he says in the Old Testament, Exodus 20, 26, he says these words, when you build an altar to me, build it out of unhewn stones. What does man want to do? Has anyone ever seen a, a, an altar of unhewn stones? Has anyone seen a pile of rocks somewhere? What's more attractive to you? You, you a pile of rocks or do you want a nice little shiny box or something that you can, you know what I mean? What, what is more attractive to you? God tells you, I want to be worshipped with unhewn stones. When you build an altar to me, build it this way. What do we think? Far out, that's untidy. Let's, uh, what we're going to do, I tell you what, they're going to fit better together, God, if we just chop a bit here and we just start making some bricks. Okay? So what do we do? And what we find, we find this in governments and we find this in churches. Right? Hebron is the word for fellowship. It is stones fit together. We see the recurring theme in the book of Corinthians where he says, we are stones fitted together into the temple of God. Is that right? The corner, chief cornerstone is who? This stone comes right through the whole book. When they walk through the wilderness for 40 years. Here's something a bit strange. What follow them? Ha! <laughs> A rock which they drank from. How's that? They were either on LSD in there or something supernatural was going on. Don't tell me God's not a God of supernatural. Well, there was something in that water if they thought the rock was following them. Can you imagine being the last one? 
You better hurry up, mate, he's coming. <laughs> the rock that followed him, it says, was Jesus. But man wants to make us all into little same boxes. Okay? This is what a Christian looks like. You're outside the book, you're a bit rough, you're a bit uncut. Hey, you're not going to fit in here, brother. God said, no, no, I'm building my, my temple, my altar, with all these odd bods. You say, I'm a bit strange. No other church accepts me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're out of the box. You're not a brick. Governments want the same thing. We can't be different. We must have equality. Everybody must be the same. It doesn't matter whether you've got different abilities. We've got equal outcomes is what we're going for now. Therefore, we've got to equal everybody out so that even the dumbest among us can end up the Prime Minister. Do you really want a dumb Prime Minister? We've probably got them. Talk about equality. God makes a difference. You want to worship me? Do it my way. Unhewn stones. This stone that's coming is Jesus. Nothing we can add to make his kingdom better. Oh, I'm on the team for Jesus. Yes, we are. We're the cheer squad. Okay? He's done. When he said it's finished, it's finished. What are you going to add to it? We always want to add something to it. Make it look better. That doesn't look right, Lord. Let me fix it. No. Get rid of the fixing mentality. Let the Lord put the stones together. We say, I don't know how you and I ended up together. That's true. That's the Lord putting the stones together. Unhewn stones. No, we're not the same. We think differently. Yes, we do. But God put us together into his little altar. Right? That's how God does things. Unhewn stones. Man does it different. You want a fellowship here? You better wear a suit. You better have a tie. Okay? We wear black shoes and we don't want to don't see a brown belt. Okay? We all drive Harley Davidsons. You don't drive a Harley. You get a little yammy or something like that. You're the second class Christian because we're all bricks here. You know what I mean? We all got to fit into this same mold. That, that's how God, go, God despises that. Every time you see that, that's the sign of Satan. Bricks. Because, why can I say that? Well, because what happened? Pharaoh is, a, is, a, uh, is one of the strong allusions to an antichrist. Right? We see a replay in the book of Revelation. The judgments that happen in Egypt happen again in the book of Revelation. Rivers turn to blood. Frogs coming out, the four frogs. And all replayed. Everything's replayed. Hailstones coming down, mingle fire. They all, all, all replayed. Pharaoh is, is a picture of Antichrist. And what did he have them doing before they got released? Making bricks. Making bricks. And it goes exactly the bricks that we're talking about here at the ten feet miry clay, clay mixed with stone because what did Pharaoh do? Normal bricks were made with straw, is that right? But towards the end Pharaoh says you can get your own straw and by the end of that we find buildings in Egypt when they, they've done the um, archaeology there they find buildings that start bricks with straw then bricks just clay because they had to, couldn't get the straw fast enough then they started stuffing anything in there which is what we're talking about in these last 10 toes here, where they've got rocks shown in and all this sort of stuff, just filling out the brick to try and give it some strength. Okay? One thing we notice about bricks, especially these sort of bricks we're talking about, is they don't last. There's no permanency in, in that sort of clay brick. You get st st strong storms. Those kingdoms don't last. Those people who are made like bricks don't last. But I tell you what lasts for thousands and thousands of years is unhewn stones. You can go and find little piles up in the Himalayas that have been there for thousands of years. And they last. So God's interested in kingdom and people that last. Okay. Have we done that to death? I don't know. All I will say about this other thing, how am I going for time? Have I got time? I had 12 to go. Okay, look, we've got to address this before we go all the way. Right. Let's just take it on face value here. Every other kingdom was defeated. Babylon got invaded and beaten. Greece then invades uh, Persia, takes over that kingdom. Rome then defeats Greece, and that's that kingdom. Who defeated Rome? That's right, nobody defeated Rome. In fact, even today, we have Roman influences through the Pope 
and Catholics and yeah, all the strong influences going on in po politics and all this sort of stuff. And you'd be surprised how many places the Pope is showing his face. Is that right? So the kingdom, the legs are still running. We're still running in the, with the influence, but no one defeated these guys. Okay? So they were never defeated, uh, but they will be when Jesus comes back. He's coming back to do the, exactly that job, to, to get all that together. But we say this, okay, so clay is people's. We have iron that's going on in there. So a lot of commentators will say this. This is people groups that can't, you know, that won't adhere to one another. Like we would say of the European Union, you know, what has Spain got to do with, you know, I don't know, the Netherlands? You know, what, what's the common thing? What, 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 what about France? What's France got to do with some of these countries that are way down the bottom? The, the only link in there is Catholicism. Culture's different, food's different, language is different. Catholicism ties this whole... The Roman influence is still in that area of the world, okay? Be careful also when you're reading these passages, it says the whole world. He, he's talking about... He uses Israel as a lens to show us. When he says the whole world, the whole known world, that area that God's going to show us, uh, the European zone and all down into that area, that down where Israel is, that is going to be the lens from which he says, it's not the, was the Aboriginals affected by this? We don't see the Aboriginal kingdom. We don't see the, the Mongol kingdom or anything like that or, or what's going on in India. No. So be careful when he says the whole world, is it the whole known world or is it the whole world? I believe that people contend on Noah's flood on this. It's evident that it was a global flood. Everyone died, okay, is what happened there. We see it in the, in the fossil record. So be careful, though, with that sort of... It comes down to definitions. So we've got these people groups in the EU that won't... But they're, they're together, but even in the EU we have strong members, iron members. Who Can, can someone name one of those? Hey, France would be one. Who's stronger? Absolutely. Germany's carrying the weight of this thing, uh, you know, economically. Merkel is the voice, man. What she says she wants to go, we move in that direction. There is iron in there, man. We're doing that. But there's clay, isn't there? What about the pigs? Portugal, Italy, you know what I mean? Rome, Greece, Spain. They're all broke. Clay members. Brittle, you know what I mean? The two coming together, very tough. So we have this mixture of, of things. Some people will interpret it that way. I'm not saying that's wrong. I, 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 I'd, I'd go with that. Here's some other things to think about, though. What about if clays are the people, and we think prophetically, the thing that's going to define in the last days before the stone comes and destroys these ten kings, or the twin, you know, which we'll get to in, in Daniel 7, but in those days, what's going to be happening? The deciding factor for God is this. Have you taken the mark of the beast? Isn't it? That's, that's the decider, isn't it? He's saying, hey, you take that mark, you can no longer be saved here. But we're going to find in the last days you're going to have people groups, clay, that's going to be mixed with iron. Chips that'll go in. You could lay something like that on it if you want to get off the wall. I'm off the wall a lot. Here's another thought. Only ever in Genesis 6 we had a strange going on. I don't know what you were aligned, you were the line of Seth person. If you are, you've got to ask the question why, if they were so good, did they all get destroyed in the Noah's flood? It's clear from all the rabb rabbinic teachings, all the early church teachings. I've got a book at home which I did look up all these on. And uh, Irenaeus, who was trained by John indirectly his view was this what I'm about to tell you Genesis 6 there was angels that left their estate that came down and procreated with women and created mighty men he said Paul you're an idiot well the question you've got to ask in that regard is why in almost every culture do we have the legends of these guys in every culture the Indian people have star people. And the Bible, stars are a metaphor for angels. Okay? Uh, and and uh, other things, I should say. But, you know, that's one of the, one of the things that uh, does apply. But, you know, what about our legends? We are seminal in influence from our background. If, you know, well, 
not Susie, not yours, I guess, but you do have some legends in this regard as well. Uh, but uh, from European nations, we have the seminal influence of Greece and we have what? Demigods, is that right? Where you have people like Hercules, mighty men of old, is that right? Men with superpower, that we said strength and all this sort of stuff. All these, these little gods with these superpowers, they are mighty men of renown. And Jesus, uh, not Jesus, uh, and in Genesis, they record these guys. They call them uh, gigantes, earthborn, people that were strange, right? They had incredible powers. Uh, they gave lots of knowledge. It says, I mean, this is all, what do you say? Um, no, you know, no one's alive today that was there, but it written down, they said, these people came and expanded their, their um their knowledge of metallurgy, their knowledge of agriculture. They brought things that so people thought they're, they're wonderful. And then we find uh, the flood has to come. Why? Because Noah is perfect in his generations. Okay? He's not defiled by the gene pool of these people. And then when they go into the promised land, God says, kill every man, woman and child in this place. Why? Because they've got genetic differences. They've come from these, these, these Nephilim that have joined with flesh. Okay? If you don't believe me, read the book of Jude. Jude says of the angels that they left their estate to go after strange flesh, okay? So there is something funny going on here. That's the background. But today, we have never, ever, 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 ever been in a place where we are right now, where we can change our genome and we can alter our DNA. We've got mice running around, rats that they've done with human brain things in there. Can you imagine the sort of things if they get loose? You got a rat with half the intelligence of a man. They're hard enough to catch as it is. What sort of damage they could they do to you? What about if you have people that start making military men that have genetic influences from a gorilla or a chimpanzee, but they've got enough human intelligence to do what they're told? But they can go out there and lift your car and just turn it over like that, no problem at all. What, what if, this is where we're looking at, and it's, it's not out of the realms of possibility where people are saying, okay, we can genetically modify the human race to be gods ourselves. We're going to rewrite God's code in our own bodies. That also may be something about the mire and the clay because it says in the book of Daniel that they will mingle with the seed of men. So the th when it says that, there is some... I mean, I'd have to go to the original languages, which I'm not proficient in, I don't know. But from what it reads in English, then what they're mingling must be something different from the seed of men. But that's only ever been possible in our generation. Isn't it funny how all these technologies just align right at the last? Okay, and then there will be strength, but it will be fragile. In the book of Revelation, we have those who take the, the chip. It's fragile. It doesn't adhere because they end up with sores. Is that right? where this thing comes out. So anyway, things to think about in that regard. The only thing I, I'd say here is, um, and we'll probably finish up, I don't really want to go through all of that, but when we look at the ten toes, I don't know how God lines that out. But if this is a picture of Gentile history in advance, then all the way up to the latter days, right? So up until the end of the age, we're talking about empires that have come out that lead us all the way up. So I haven't got a list, so you, you help me sing out here. But all I know is there was out of Rome, and it was ruled by Rome, there was a Spanish empire, is that right? Did I spell that right? Yes. Wasn't there? Before that even, you'd be proud, there was a Dutch Empire, also previously ru ruled by Rome. Okay, so that comes through and becomes feet that, that are hanging off these things. What about, uh, of course, we have Roman Empire, I suppose. If you want to count that as being one of those toes, I suppose, let's have a look at that. There was also the Portuguese Empire. Is that right? Um, French, that was a big one. Franks. Uh, they weren't ruled. Uh, anyway, we'll go with that. And then was 
Uh, there was a, a re, one of Greece that came in. There was the Han Empire. Okay. Then there was the Germanic Empire as well, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. So all of these were uh, German, Germanic Empire. Well, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, Sorry? Yes, there was the, the course. <laughs> How can we forget? Uh, I'm a Scot man, they never conquered me. <laughs> All right, uh, so we've got the British Empire. <laughs> Absolutely. Coming out of Rome, they went to Britain, 55 uh, BC. Okay, so where are we? Eight, two to go. Let's have a look. There depends now. I don't, that's why I say I don't know how God looks at this because there's more than 10 if you count like Lithuanian empires and things like that. I don't know what God would do, but somewhere in this prophecy, God means there to be 10 empires that have been there. Okay, so we know the British Empire for sure, the Dutch, Spanish would have to be there. Uh, France Empire had to be there. The Hun Empire would be one. You could say uh, Lithuania would be another one. Sorry? Ottoman. Yeah, Ottoman, that's right, exactly. Oh, you're on it. Well, that's another thing that would come in that, we, that is often ignored. So that would be 10, but there's others that you could put on there. Uh, but I, it depends on how God defines it. He'll tell me when I'm up there. But all of, the thing is that all of the empires that come out and have ruled that area, why hasn't India come up and ruled it? What about China? Where are they coming up? What about the Sudanese? Why didn't they come up and rule in there? I tell you why. Because God tells history before it happens. All the empires that have ruled that piece of dirt have come out of Rome. There's two legs, Eastern Empire, and that would be another thing that I'm struggling to fit in prophecy. If there's two legs, five on either side, because when we get into Daniel 7, you'll find there's ten kings and three. Three come up first, then there's seven that come on there later that make up the ten. So... I don't know how all that fits, so I guess to be honest, I don't know. But all I want to show you today is that there's a huge density in two verses that God gives. Unbelievable how God tells all of the history of the Gentile nations that are in that area in advance. Isaiah 46.10, I am God and there is no other, telling the end from the beginning. And if we know this then we know that Jesus is coming and he will destroy. And in the end times though, in the latter days, something funny, I don't know how all this goes on, but there's something funny that will happen because the, 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 the stone comes, and that's how we know it's latter days because when the stone, unhewn stone came the first time, he didn't set up a kingdom that swallowed up every kingdom straight away. That's not what's going on. But he comes back in the second time and he will swallow up every kingdom. Okay, so we know this applies to the last, last days here. And I've lost my thought. What was I saying? Yeah, it was a good stone though. Maybe I'm stoned, I don't know. <laughs> stoned with Jesus. I don't know, it couldn't have been important. Anyway, so we've got... Uh, a lot to look at with the, the density in Daniel. Like I say, any skeptic can come. That's why they say of Daniel, it must have been written beforehand. But how could it be? It's locked in at 270 BC is what's going on. Not only have we got the lengths being proportionate with the body, the length of the empires, we tell you how many legs there are in the empires, and when we get into the beasts in Daniel 7, you'll find out he drills down into even more detail. This is a book like no other. It makes you say, God, I don't know, I don't understand all your ways. Your ways are higher than my ways. But I tell you what, I know you're there. Yes. And I know that you're in history. Therefore, we can have hope for tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. Because tomorrow he holds. And we read that we might be going through some stuff now, but we read the end. Jesus coming back. And we'll be with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why it says, when we see these things, we look up, and the other verse that comes, it says, hey, it's a blessed hope. A blessed hope. We had one dear sister that just passed during the night. She's enjoying her blessed hope now. The blessed hope is to see Jesus. Whether you see him at the rapture, it's, the blessed hope is not the rapture. The blessed hope is to see Jesus. We'll see him at the end of our lives, or we'll see him in the clouds that dear sister will see him face to face now. Absent from the body is present from the Lord. We endure here so that we're witnesses for him. But go out in strength. This should encourage your faith to know that God is real. And that whatever he has in store for Australia, 
is under his control, not Albanese. If things aren't easy under Albanese, that's God. If things are easy under Albanese, that's God. He turns the heart of kings. If we get a wicked king, it's because we're a wicked people. We need to be on our face praying, seeking his face, searching for righteousness to come to this nation. We do that. God may see, hear our prayers and restore that. But I want to tell you that his, he has Australia in his control. We need not fear.